Welcome everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Thank you for joining us for this virtual U Health International Medical Series presentation. Bascom Palmer Eye Institute and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center presents Innovations in Ocular Oncology, featuring distinguished ophthalmologists and oncologists from Bascom Palmer Eye Institute and Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's program. We are delighted to announce that Bascom Palmer Eye Institute has been rated the number one hospital in the US. And tonight you're gonna to learn more about why they've earned that distinction for 19 years. Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center is also the only cancer hospital that received the National Cancer Institute NCI designation in South Florida. Our experts are ready to care for your patients in one of our five Florida facilities for second opinion consultations or via telemedicine from the comfort of their home. To refer a patient, we invite you to contact Hugh Health International at 305-243-9100 by email at uhealthinternational at med.miami.edu or by visiting uhealthinternational.com. Do not worry, we're going to put this contact information for you now and also probably at the end so that you can be familiar. Well, tonight you're going to hear from three experts who will share emerging ocular oncology innovations and how they can best be used to provide the very best eye care for your patients. Dr. William Harbour will present recent breakthroughs in uveal melanoma. Dr. Zelia Correa will present contemporary clinical management of uveal melanoma. Dr. Jose Lutsky will present treatment of advanced uveal melanoma light at the end of the tunnel. Now, during the presentation, we'd like to tell you that we will poll the audience on topics relevant to the discussion. So we ask that you participate and be a proactive member. Uh, your responses will be anonymous. Uh, we also want you to ask questions of our expert panelists. Those who have not done it in advance, we're going to ask you to look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the Q&A feature, and that is how you are going to do it through that toolbar. We're going to prepare the questions for our presenters, and at the end of the presentation, they are going to respond to you. So with that in mind, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. William Harbour, one of the most highly respected ocular oncologists in the world. A professor of ophthalmology and director of ocular oncology services, Dr. Harbour discovered the key gene mutations in uveal melanoma and subsequently invented a highly innovative prognostic test for the disease based on gene expression profiling and computer machine learning. This test has become the standard of care throughout the United States and is considered the most accurate prognostic test available for ocular melanoma, benefiting thousands of patients each year. Dr. Harbour's team of visionary scientists at his Bascom Palmer Laboratory focus on the identification of genetic, epigenetic, and genomic abnormalities that lead to poor patient outcomes in uveal melanoma, retinoblastoma, and other eye cancers with the goal of developing more prognostic biomarkers and targeted molecular therapies that will lead to improved survival. Tonight, he will present recent breakthroughs in uveal melanoma. Please welcome Dr. Harbour. Thank you very much for that introduction and welcome all of you uh, to this uh, presentation. Uh, this is uh, a combined presentation of, of our Baskin Palmer and uh, Sylvester uh, Cancer Center teams. Uh, we are uh, an integrated team as you will see tonight. And uh, it's my pleasure to start off um, with a discussion of recent breakthroughs in UVA melanoma. This is my disclosure. And I'm going to highlight tonight um, three uh, things. Uh, the cycle of discovery uh, in, uh, in our research um, that goes from the clinic to the laboratory uh, and back to the clinic. And we'll see some examples of that. And secondly, we'll talk about some specific discoveries that are being brought to from the laboratory back to the clinic uh, even as we speak. And then I'll mention our collaborative ocular oncology group, which is now a North American group, but we would like to see uh, this type of network grow to a truly international uh, group. So the cycle of discovery starts with the patient. 
uh, it starts with the problems that we have in taking care of patients. And, in, and uh, our focus tonight that will be on patients with uveal melanoma. And we know that a, a major problem is uh, the ability to prevent uh, metastatic disease or to treat metastatic disease. Uh, there are other issues uh, that Dr. Cohea will discuss in terms of management of vision and management of the eye. In my talk, I'm going to focus on the problem of metastatic disease. And I'm very fortunate to have talented young people in my laboratory that literally come from all over the world uh, to work in the lab and to learn about this disease and to make their contribution to improve patient care. We make discoveries in the laboratory that we bring back to the clinic. Um, it was mentioned one of these things that we brought back to the clinic, which was a, a prognostic test uh, for uveal melanoma that continues to improve, and I'll discuss that. Uh, and then we go back to the laboratory and ask, well, now that we know patients who uh, have a poor prognosis, what can we discover that we can bring back to the clinic and potentially improve their survival? So we'll see examples of that as I proceed. This is a summary of about 15 years worth of work in my laboratory, uh, where we first uh, discovered a gene expression profile that uh, distinguished uh, uveal melanomas that had a poor prognosis from those with a good prognosis. We later found that you can later uh, further subdivide these class one and class two tumors into uh, class 1A or class 1B. And we now know that this distinction uh, is even more accurately uh, 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 demonstrated by the presence or absence of the expression of a gene called preen. And we'll talk about that. So we now have a four class system. Uh, the main distinction is still class one from class two, but then we can further subdivide them into preen positive and preen negative. And then on top of that, we now know the actual driver mutations that are associated with these groups. Uh, the, the most important uh, being uh, BAP1 mutations, which uh, lead to the class two uh, poor prognostic type. And we'll talk about that uh, further as we go on. For the last 10 years, this has been the, the, the basic class one, class two test has been the standard of care in the United States for prognostic testing in patients. And this is used routinely in most centers uh, for uh, surveillance testing uh, and uh, for entry into adjuvant clinical trials. Um, the group that performed this, uh, uh, this um, prospective analysis, this is the only test uh, to date that has ever been uh, validated prospectively um, in a multi-center uh, prospective trial for uveal melanoma. And these are the collaborating centers uh, that uh, are currently part of this collaborative group. And uh, currently we are in the latest phase of the, of the second study in this, um, in this series uh, where we enrolled over 1,700 patients in less than three years. So this is the largest accruing study ever in uveal melanoma. And we are further um, validating these additional uh, factors in addition to gene expression profiling and preen, we're looking at how do we integrate the mutations and chromosomal changes uh, into an optimized uh, platform. Now, the next direction as we see for this collaborative ocular oncology group is international collaborations as I discussed. And one of our leading uh, um, ideas and uh, most exciting opportunities will be in the area of genetic ancestry. Um, we recently published just a couple of months ago that uh, although white, uh, European people of European ancestry are um, uh, most commonly thought of as uh, the group that developed uveal melanoma. We certainly see in my clinic here in Miami, where we get patients from all over Latin America and beyond, and our colleagues from Latin America would tell you that that's certainly not the case, that not every patient is a white European. Um, and not only that, but we can use uh, quantitative genetic ancestry to look at the risk of uh, uveal melanoma uh, poor prognosis uh, in association with different uh, genetic ancestries. And what we've shown, uh, interestingly, is that uh, those with non-European backgrounds actually may have a better prognosis. Um, and, and that doesn't mean they're 100% uh, non-European. 
that's the, uh, that's the uh, benefit of using quantitative genetic ancestry is we can look at each segment of each chromosome and which uh, background that that chromosomal segment came from and determine which segments are contributing to poor prognosis. So those with increased European background have more likelihood of PRAME expression, which is a poor prognostic factor. And interestingly, the class two gene expression profile uh, is associated with um, a, a, a cluster of immune genes on chromosome three that is near the COVID-19 uh, Neanderthal immune gene cluster that seems to uh, put patients at increased risk for bad outcome with COVID-19. So this suggests that the immune system may be playing a role in the bad outcome in uh, patients with class two uvomelanoma, and we'll touch upon that later. Another direction of the, uh, the COOG uh, is the addition of medical oncology. We're now moving beyond uh, prognostic testing. We believe that that is now a mature technology, at least based on uh, tumor uh, biopsy. Uh, we believe that we now have probably about as good a uh, test that you can have. And we now want to move this to the uh, medical oncology realm where we can take high-risk patients and treat them either in the uh, uh, adjuvant uh, or preventative setting or in the metastatic setting based on all this information, this knowledge that we're gaining. Um, so how would we do that? If we go back to our genomic landscape and we flip this into a little cartoon here, uh, we can see that all of the tumors start off um, as a uveal melanocyte that then undergoes a mutation in something called the GQ pathway. This would be the GNAQ and GNA11 mutations. And then they get one of three uh, prognostic driver mutations. Uh, and for our purposes, we can really focus on this lower part here. This is where the vast, vast majority of patients get into trouble. Those that become class two, uh, they have baffling mutations and loss of chromosome three. So how do we prevent uh, these patients who already likely have micrometastatic disease from progressing to metastatic disease. Um, in other words, how can we target these BAP1 mutations? Well, we uh, undertook a large um, multi-phase screening effort uh, to look at uh, uh, clinically available compounds that might be able to reverse the effects of BAP1 loss. Uh, this is a paper that was just published uh, last month. Um, and we went through multiple different uh, stages of uh, chemical screens, uh, and in vivo uh, screening for toxicity and efficacy. And we identified this HDAC inhibitor, Quisinostat, uh, as the optimal compound. And we've shown in, in mouse models uh, that it can slow or arrest the growth of small tumors uh, in vivo uh, in a BAP1 mutation dependent manner. Um, so this is uh, a, a study that we are hoping to open in the near future uh, at Bascom Palmer and Sylvester uh, Cancer Center. And Dr. Lutsky will be uh, discussing this in uh, greater detail. We can also go back and look at PRAME. PRAME is independent uh, uh, prognostic factor of BAP1. It adds poor prognosis to the BAP1 mutation. So we could look at uh, targeting BAP1 and uh, PRAME. What are some ways that uh, we can target uh, PRAME. Well, most of the evidence is uh, so far is pointing to PRAME as a target of immunotherapy. This is a study that we performed a few years ago now where we could show that uvm melanoma cells expressing PRAME could be recognized by T cells uh, from patients. So um, the focus right now in PRAME, and PRAME, by the way, is not only expressed in uvm melanoma, but even more so in cutaneous melanoma, in leukemia and other cancers. So um, uh, pharmaceutical companies are very interested um, in uh, this, uh, this uh, target. And one of the most interesting targets, uh, uh, interesting compounds at the moment is this immunocore uh, compound um, that, uh, that drives T cells to attack uh, cells expressing a prime. And since prime should normally be expressed only in the testis, um, it should have little effect on normal cells. And uh, there's a number of other uh, approaches being uh, used both in academia and in, in industry 
to attack Crain because of its uh, emerging importance uh, in uh, cancer. And then finally, we have only talked about the genetics so far, but there's a very important component that we have to consider, and that's the immune system. And we, we're now, it's now becoming clear that the genes themselves are not alone determining, pro determining prognosis, but it's the gene mutations and their interaction with the immune microenvironment that's determining uh, prognosis. So for example, the EIF1AX and SF3B1 mutations seem to uh, still allow some immune uh, surveillance uh, by the patient's immune system that can slow down, maybe not forever, but for some period of time can slow down the emergence of metastatic disease. For example, we know that patients with SF3B1 mutations in class one tumors, they have an a, a intermediate risk of metastasis, but that tends to occur many years later. And we believe that that's because the immune system is able to slow this down and control it for some period of time. While in contrast, the BAP1 loss leads to this altered immune microenvironment where that, that inhibits the patient's immune response from uh, killing the cancer cells or holding them at bay. And we sh uh, showed this uh, recently uh, in a paper earlier this year in Nature Communication. And I'm cutting just down to the part of that article that talked about the immune microenvironment. But we see from our single cell sequencing data of uh, both primary and metastatic human melanomas, that these, cell, these tumors are, um, they have many, many immune cells. They have T cells and B cells and dendritic cells and macrophages, but they're not very functional in the class two tumors. And we identified one potential explanation for that, which is that the checkpoint molecules that are targeted by um, uh, uh, most uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapies, PD-1 and CTLA-4, are not really ex highly expressed, but instead a different uh, checkpoint inhibitor, LAG-3, uh, is expressed in these uh, tumors. And so Dr. Uh, uh, Lutsky will uh, discuss further uh, this uh, uh, discovery and a study that we have already, a clinical trial that we have already initiated for patients uh, uh, at Baskin Palmer and Sylvester Cancer Center. So I hope that you can see from this short uh, presentation uh, that it really is critical uh, that we have this cycle of discovery that goes from the laboratory to the patient care clinic and the operating room. We, then we take that back to the laboratory until we can come up with new um, treatments for patients. And so we are um, uh, really on the brink of really being able to change the, uh, the, the prognosis uh, of these patients. And we're entering into a very exciting time with Baskin Palmer and Sylvester leading the way uh, in this uh, research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harbour. And um, we welcome your colleagues from all over the world. And uh, we'll, we'll present the first poll question to them to uh, gauge their feedback on this. And that is, which gene mutation is the most important predictor of metastasis in uveal melanoma? And we should put those up in a moment now so that our participants can check the box of the one that they think is correct. So any second now, there it is. Which gene mutation is the most important predictor of metastasis in uveal melanoma? A, GNAQ, B, PRAIM, C, BAP1, or D, monosomy three. We'll give our participants a few seconds to answer and we will see the result uh, for you, Dr. Harbour, to comment and um, see what your colleagues from all over the world who are joining us tonight on this important topic have to say on this question. And we will have two other poll questions throughout uh, this program, by the way, everyone, so that you have opportunities to answer the other two as well. Okay, we should have results now. So, Dr. Harbour, what uh, what what's the answer? Well, the majority, of the, the the leading answer is correct. It is BAP1 mutation. So, GNAQ mutations are initiating events that are required for cancer formation, but they are not prognostic. Prime is very prognostic, but it's not a mutation. It's kind of a trick question. Prime is just aberrantly expressed. It's it's but it's not mutated. 
And then monosomy three is important in prognosis, but it's not a mutation either. That is the loss of a chromosome. So BAP1 mutation is the correct answer. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Harbour. And uh, you'll all have a chance to ask questions of Dr. Harbour throughout the evening. But our next speaker that I will introduce is Dr. Zelia Correa, a professor of ophthalmology and co-director of Bascom Palmer's Ocular Oncology Laboratory. Dr. Correa specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of eye tumors such as ocular melanoma, retinoblastoma, ocular metastasis, and choroidal hemangioma. Actively involved in artificial intelligence, Dr. Correa's research focuses on its use to distinguish benign from malignant ocular tumors based upon imaging characteristics. Tonight, she is going to speak to you about contemporary clinical management of uveal melanoma. Dr. Correa, you're up. Thank you so much. This is just a fabulous forum and a wonderful opportunity to share with our colleagues up there in the time of pandemic. I, you know, being from Latin America, I want to give a shout out to all of our colleagues in Latin America who have joined us. This is a tremendous pleasure. It has come to me to talk about con contemporary clinical management of uveal melanoma. So the contemporary management of uveal melanoma certainly falls to the treatment of the primary tumor. And obviously in that manner, we do have to consider the borderline lesions or the intermediate lesions as some say. And so laser, um, TTT, and even photodynamic therapy may be applicable there. Radiation obviously is the standard of care now for most uveal melanomas, plaques, proton beam radiation therapy, even stereotactic radiation therapy. The management of treatment complications, both medical and surgical. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then the systemic treatment with Dr. Jose Lutsky is going to share with us. So to start, let me talk a little bit about transpupillary thermal therapy that we started by using it very frequently in tumors that probably weren't the best candidates for it. And we found out that there was a lot of recurrence rate, you know, and, and people that were using it for even medium-sized melanomas, you know, often ran into recurrences and issues. However, for small tumors, especially in this example, where the patient was biopsied and shown to be a um, really borderline lesion with a prime uh, negative class 1A gene expression profile, and you see the patient had a lot of subretinal fluid surrounding the tumor and obviously limiting the vision tremendously. Here you see the same patient then, um, here was one month after the biopsy, then the patient was treated by thermal therapy. And here you see the patient two months after the treatment and you notice the fovea is back functionally normally and the patient is 20, 20 minus one, which is an awesome result. Here is the appearance on OCT. Prior to the treatment, you can see a small eruption of the tumor secondary to the biopsy performed. However, when I treated this patient with the thermal therapy, I knew for a fact that this was a low malignant potential lesion, and for that matter, really a great candidate for thermal therapy. And here you can see the OCT that matches that picture then two months after the treatment. Small coronal melanocytic tumors have always posed a great challenge for us, not only in terms of diagnosis, but also in terms of vision loss. Long gone the days that we feel small coronal melanocytic lesions, even the benign ones, are just, you know, innocent little spots in the fundus. These lesions can acquire very important chronic features, including subretinal fluid, that may be very damaging to the patient's vision. So I'm sharing with you a patient, um, actually 23 years old, with this documented lesion for about eight years and lack of progression. This was a patient that I saw in my previous center, and the patient really came in because she had a significant loss of vision, 2040 vision with that and some metamorphopsia. And you can see the chronic subretinal fluid extending right adjacent to the fovea. So this is the OCT that matches that image I just shared with you where you could see definitely a subretinal membrane here and the presence of that fluid really inching very, very close to the fovea. Oops, I'm sorry. Little oops, technical difficulty here. 
So prior to PDT, as I said, the visual acuity was low, and then eight months post, PD, post PDT, the vision was 2020. And here I want to show you the outcome. You notice the membrane still there, but dormant, and this time not shedding any fluid. And you notice here the fovea completely dry. However, as we all know, there is definitely some loss of photoreceptors, but the patient did very well. 2020 vision, she was very satisfied. And one year after the PDT, she remained stable. Another point that we have to bring up is precision plaque brachytherapy. For a long, long time, we were still following the um, COMS guidelines that you know every tumor had to be treated at a minimum of five millimeters in thickness. And that went on for a long time. And while a lot of globe salvage occurred and all of us knew that plaque brachytherapy or radiation per se was a very um, safe treatment for choroidal melanomas. We knew that a lot of patients suffered significant vision loss and many eyes ended up being lost because we probably were treating these patients with too much radiation. Too much radiation, not just because of apical dose that we were giving, but also because we were treating a larger area than needed to be treated. So I'm sharing with you new software that we use in order to really plan for the treatment in a matter that is customized for each patient's tumor. So in terms of precision plaque brachytherapy, we can do plaque customization that involves plaque design, as you're seeing here, a standard COMS plaque, but you see on the diagram that the tumor is fairly small and you notice the distribution of seeds is not full to um, complete the plaque. So you see that the distribution really follows the size of the tumor and what is needed. We can also work in terms of implant size, seed distribution and radiation dose. And I'm gonna offer some examples here. So first plaque design, we have this amazing 3D modeling software that allows us to really study the distribution of radiation, not in terms, not only in terms of what the tumor is going to receive, but the margins, the disc, the fovea, even the lens and the sclera. This way we can really bounce off the risks and benefits of that radiation dose, thus making it much more customized. And hopefully, and as we've seen in our preliminary results, we are getting patients to keep a lot better vision than they would otherwise with just the standard uh, uh, planning for the plaques. Plaque size is another thing we've been innovating with. And what that means is when we have small tumors that are very posterior around the nerve, it is challenging for the surgeons to be able to insert small plaques behind the eye. That incurs in a lot of um, problems in terms of accidents that may happen, a puncture of the sclera, difficulty rotating the eye. Sometimes even we have to disinsert more muscles than we normally would. So what we're doing is we're planning custom distribution of seeds to only cover the tumor while using slightly larger plaques that we can put our sutures at the equator. This way, obviously bigger plaques, we won't have as much tilting and we'll have a much more stable implant. Meanwhile, we're still delivering only the necessary dose, bearing in mind all the damage to the disc, to the fovea, et cetera, et cetera. And then it poses the question, the standard COMS plaques versus the new design, the iPhysics plaques. And neither of them is consistently superior. And um, the group here led by Dr. Harbour has reported on that. And what we really need is dosimetric comparison in each patient. And it comes back to the point that ocular oncology is really a multidisciplinary specialty. We need Ocul uh, oncologists like Dr. Jose Lutsky. We need the radiation oncologists to be able to debate and discuss how we can do precision plaque brachytherapy. We need the pathologist. We need the pediatric oncologist and so forth and so on. So the COMS plaques proved to be superior for small temporal tumors, while the iPhysics plaques were better for large nasal tumors. The iPhysics plaque also allows treatment of um, 
circumpapillary tumors that cover more than 180 degrees of the disc. As you can see here, this is a patient that we recently treated that had actually a very unusual recurrence. The patient was initially treated elsewhere for a tumor that was localized in this area and had actually three nodular recurrences, as you can see. And we used this large iPhysics plaque that had a large notch, as you can see, really hugging the disc very nicely. However, we chose not to put radiation in an area that had been previously radiated. And we also did not choose to radiate the area that matches the fovea. What about radiation dose and how this radiation is distributed? Based on the design of these distinct plaques, we know that iPhysics plaques will have a hotter spot really close to the sclera. Meanwhile, the COMS plaques will have a larger, wider distribution in order to reach that apical dose that we aim for in ureal melanoma. So all of these factors, again, are very mind. Now I would like to start sharing how do we manage the complications of radiation because that is a fact and that's something that for many, many years we just didn't do very much about it. So this is a patient that had a parse plane of vitrectomy for vitreous and subretinal hemorrhage following biopsy. And here you can see a very dense hemorrhage. The patient was on Plavix and um, the biopsy itself was very uneventful. After the biopsy, she had very minor hemorrhage around the tumor, but one month later, that hemorrhage cap um, reoccurring and she finally had a very dense hemorrhage. And you can see there how that um, vitrectomy really clears everything up very nicely. We used PFO to dislodge the um, hemorrhage that was really threatening the fovea there, as you can see. And then we did the air exchange there and the patient did tremendously. She is now two months post-op and she has 20-25 vision. Now we're gonna look at what we do in terms of repair of regmatogenous retinal detachment following radiation and thermal therapy. So this was a patient that had a superior tumor that was plaqued successfully. However, right before the plaque insertion, he was noted to have an eruption through Brooks membrane. And, you know, not surprisingly, that eruption started bleeding a little bit and the decision was made to do thermal therapy. And here you're seeing me um, endoresecting the tumor, the apex of the tumor, separating the retina from the tumor there. And then you will see, you know, more of that endoresection, which is really a shaving off of the apex of the tumor followed by diathermy. So here you can see my two hands, vitrector here, diathermy there, and then endolaser and silicone oil. And I will share with you the patient's um, final view. And that is the view under PFO. This patient is now 2080, doing great. And in a few months, we'll be able to remove that silicone oil. And this is another treatment of complications. This patient is a patient that initially showed up with significant subretinal and preretinal hemorrhage associated with the melanoma. This patient got a plaque, then got a vitrectomy and developed this very important epiretinal membrane. And there you can see me peeling that epiretinal membrane under um, ICG staining. And you will see there the membranes that these patients often develop is very brittle, very difficult to peel. You cannot peel it under a single um, just tear. You have to really go back multiple and copious time. I say, you know, for you to do vitreoretinal surgery and tumors, you have to be persistent, very, very persistent. And so you can see there the whole membrane removed, then um, PFO to stabilize the macula, and then we're going to laser the patient there right at the edge of it. And the patient did really, really well under oil so far. And this is the final case I wanna show you because this is a patient that developed tumor toxic syndrome 21 months after plaque. And here you see us putting some iris hooks. The patient was already pseudophagic, a very poorly dilating pupil. And there you see shaving up the vitreous base 
and there a tumor endoresection. And then there was a large, large subretinal hematoma that had to be nudged out and pulled out with a max grip forceps, as you can see there. And you're seeing there the removal of that, um, that big hematoma and then removal of all those subretinal exudates there, PFO laser and oil, obviously. And the patient did really, really well afterwards. Here you can see post-op day one and day six, and then a month out. And the patient did extremely well afterwards. So the take home message for us is that the contemporary treatment of uveal melanoma involves not only globe salvage, but also precision radiation therapy and other preserving interventions. I did not have time to go into medical or, or pharmacological treatment of radiation retinopathy because the time did not allow for that. But anti-VEGF treatment, intravitreal steroids, modern vitro retinal surgery have improved globe, globe retention and vision salvage. And that's what we're aiming for. We really are at a point where we want to turn the page from treating tum tumors and patients with radiation, telling them that they are inevitably going to lose their vision because they have a malignant tumor inside their eyes. We want to give them hope, not only hope for survival, but hope for visual retention and quality of life. And I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Correa. And uh, we go right into the second poll question. So you have an opportunity to question your colleague from across the world. And that is soon to come up on your screen so that they can answer. What is a change in the management of choroidal melanoma? A, surgical implantation of plaque brachytherapy. B, COMS protocol for plaque brachytherapy. C, 3D model for plaque brachytherapy. Or D, fully loaded plaques for brachytherapy. We're going to give them a moment, a few seconds to answer and take a look at the results so that you can comment. And I'll remind you all that you have a unique opportunity to question these experts um, and submit your questions by using the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You see the little Q&A bubble there. That is where you will enter your questions for our panelists and we will tee them up for them. So let's see how we did. Perfect. I think everybody really paid attention to my talk and I'm very pleased about that. I see that there is one question on the question and answer and I'll go ahead and answer that pretty quickly because it's a very important point. Um, so what steps do I take to prevent extraocular tumor extension associated with vitrectomy? Well, number one, I don't do vitrectomy in eyes that have active tumor. So all of these eyes that I did surgery, um, except for the one that was after a biopsy that proved to be um, GP class 1A prime negative, these eyes are all radiated. But besides that, what we do is we cryo each and every sclerotomy. And if there is any doubt that there may, there may be some active tumor there, I do open the conge then I put my sclerotomies, I cryo that, and then I close the conjunctiva just to add an extra layer of separation, an extra layer of protection for the eye. And this way, fortunately, we have not had any extraocular extensions on the site of vitrectomies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Correa. You're too quick for us. You went ahead and answered that question until the Q&A uh, section, but there will be more, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And now that leads us to our final speaker of the evening before those questions begin. And that is Dr. Jose Lutsky. Dr. Lutsky is professor of clinical medicine and director of cutaneous oncology at the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. He was previously the director of Mount Sinai Melanoma Program at Mount Sinai Cancer Center in Miami Beach. Dr. Lutsky graduated from Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul Medical School in Brazil after his residency in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center and fellowship in hematology oncology at Columbia University, he joined the University of California, Irvine until 1994 when he relocated to his present position. His main interest is the search for new treatments for melanoma and other cutaneous malignancies. And we are going to welcome Dr. Lutsky sharing his screen. Dr. Lutsky, in case you are muted, unmute yourself, please. 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to share the screen here for a second. Not a problem. Yeah. We've got plenty of time. Okay, um, are you guys able to see my screen? And not yet, sir. Not I'm yet. Okay, we'll just take a couple seconds see, here yes. and uh, get that again. going in presentation mode so that uh, we can all get the benefit of seeing. There you go. Okay. You're uh, up. Swap. Got it? Perfect. Okay, all right. I'm sorry about that. Not at uh, all. It's, it's uh, my pleasure to be a part of this uh, seminar with, with the international audience. I appreciate everybody that is attending the seminar today. And um, let's start by saying that I do think there is light at the end of the tunnel uh, in the treatment of advanced uterine melanoma. There has been a disease uh, very difficult to treat. Melanoma in general uh, has been said as that it was a disease that gave cancer a bad name. So that can no longer be said for cutaneous melanoma because now we have such great treatments for cutaneous melanoma. Unfortunately, uveal melanoma now uh, has inherited that title, but uh, I think that even there, uh, we're gonna be making uh, a lot of progress. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that about 50% of the patients with uveal melanoma that walk into your office will develop metastatic disease, and most of them will eventually succumb to this metastatic disease. Now, it's interesting that, you know, melanoma, uh, uveal melanoma and cutaneous melanoma, they're both melanoma, they both come from one cell type, but they're completely different diseases. As you can see here, beginning with the incidence, uveal melanoma is a rare disease. Cutaneous melanoma, not so rare. Uh, the cause for cutaneous melanoma, we have some clues. We know it's related to ultraviolet radiation. We really don't know what causes uveal melanoma. The mutational spectrum is completely different from what we see in cutaneous and uveal melanoma. The management is different. Uh, we, we assess uh, risk in a different fashion, as Dr. Harbour referred to earlier, and we're going to talk a little bit more now. Uh, and then, interestingly, the metastatic pattern uh, at presentation is significantly different. Uh, as you know, uveal melanoma's first site of metastatic disease tends to be the liver, uh, which uh, is, is somewhat unusual. And then uh, is a major difference in treatment. As I said before, we now have a number of treatment regimens that are effective and FDA approved to treat uh, cutaneous melanoma, but there's no uh, FDA approved treatment specifically for uveal melanoma to date. And, and, and our hope is that we got to change that. Uh, uh, again, uh, having the ability to know which patients are at high risk of recurrence and which, patient, which patients are not is of obvious importance. There are a number of prognostic models that can be found in the literature, but only a few of them have been properly validated. So here we see the American Joint Committee for Cancer Staging System uh, with the respective metastasis-free survival curve on the right. And looking at this a little bit more closely in terms of the T component, the T category, what but the HACC looks at the basal diameter of the tumor, the thickness, the ciliary body involvement, the extraocular extension. And then the end category refers to presence of lymph nodes or non-contiguous deposits in the orbit. And the M category has to do with the size of metastatic disease. So that's a lot of information that you need to get to, 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 to get to a, prognos a prognostic uh, impression on these patients. Now, in the, in the United States, at least, uh, uh, the most widely and uh, extensively validated prognostic tool has been referred to earlier by Dr. Harbour, who's actually his discovery, is a 15-gene expression profile that separates uveal melanoma into very different groups, class one and class two. 
Uh, and um, uh, another important finding is that the patients with class two GEP almost invariably have deletion of the BAP1 gene. And the BAP1 gene, as you know, is important in a variety of functions in the differentiation and survival of um, um, uh, uvial melanoma cells. So uh, here we also see uh, the, the difference in the chance of metastasis in five years from the different classes. Class one is subdivided in 1A and 1B uh, with two and 20% chance of metastatic disease in five years. And class two, uh, high risk at 72% odds of metastasis within five years. Uh, Prain, as previously mentioned, further increases the risk of metastasis both in class one and in class two uvul melanomas. So, and this study uh, actually compared the GP Prain uh, prognostic test to the HACC. And, and, and this uh, uh, data here shows that there is better separation of the prognostic groups. Uh, when you use uh, the uh, gene expression profile in prey. So I want you to briefly glimpse at the treatment landscape for cutaneous melanoma. So here on the left, I have this in dark because it represents the dark ages of melanoma that, that lasted several decades up until 2011, when the first uh, treatments, uh, immunotherapy for cutaneous melanoma uh, were approved. And since then, you've seen this tremendous proliferation of uh, treatments uh, that are not only numbers, but they also show significant efficacy. Uh, the historical five-year survival for cutaneous melanoma was five to 7%. And now you see where we are now with some of these curves uh, up to uh, 52% at five years. Now, I want to contrast that with uh, the data for uveal melanoma. This is one of the most recent meta-analysis in metastatic uveal melanoma study of 912 patients. Uh, and, and, and here you see a uh, you know, very different curve. Uh, median progression-free survival here was only 3.3 months. Uh, the median uh, overall survival was 10.2 months. And the one-year survival rate was 43%. To think about that, less than half of the patients with metastatic melanoma will be alive one year after the diagnosis. Uh, the other important thing is when you look at patients that received liver-directed therapy, there appear to be a, a slightly better survival, 14.3% compared to 9 to, to 10 months. But you need to consider that patients that received liver-directed therapies maybe were patients that did not have as extensive disease to begin with. These are the types of liver-directed therapy that have been used. Uh, there are uh, treatments uh, related to hepatic artery embolization and, and, and with a number of, of variations, uh, just from simple embolization to immunoembolization to chemoembolization to radioembolization. There are uh, treatments with hepatic artery infusion of chemotherapy or perfusion, either percutaneous or isolated. Surgical resection is an option for a very small group of patients. Uh, and uh, all forms of ablation uh, can be used in specific cases of patients with significant uh, liver uh, disease. So here are some of the liver-directed therapy trials for metastatic uveal melanoma they are currently uh, being pursued. Now, after many clinical trials over the years, I think it's very safe to say that standard chemotherapy does not work uh, for uveal melanoma. Um, uh, response rates vary from zero to 3%, uh, if, if that much. Uh, and one of the major areas of research in the treatment of metastatic uveal melanoma has been an attempt to target the proliferative pathways of the uveal melanoma cell. So, so the main pathways that uh, are, have been targeted are, you know, the G alpha signaling pathway uh, that that occurs because of normal signal that is felt to be related to the GNAC and the GN11 mutations that are very common. In seeing almost all patients 
with uveal melanoma. Um, and uh, these G alpha signaling uh, uh, also uh, goes to downstream stimulation via a PKC pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, and also on the other side, the, uh, the um, uh, PI3K, AKT M4 pathway. Uh, there is another pathway that's not noted here. Oh, it is. The, the YAP pathway is also a more recent uh, discover that, that, that has uh, uh, been found to be important in the proliferous signal. As you can see here, and all of these pathways have actually been targeted and been tested. And, and unfortunately, uh, I don't know if you can see in your slides, but the response rates and progression free survivals uh, have not been uh, very uh, enc encouraging. These are some of the current targeted therapy trials for metastatic uveal melanoma. Uh, there are some new targets here, for example, uh, uh, for uh, patients that have a BEP1 loss, uh, there is a trial using a PARP inhibitor. Why would we do that? Because BEP1 loss leads to impaired DNA repair that makes these tumors potentially more susceptible to PARP inhibitors. Uh, here is another target also, the, this last trial uh, with a focal adhesion kinase inhibitor, FAK inhibitor, uh, that uh, focal adhesion kinase inhibitor inhibits the proliferative signal through the YAP pathway that I mentioned earlier. And an, uh, another trial here targets BRD4, and it's an epigenetic modifier. Here is a depiction of the multiple ways that epigenetic therapies could be used and are being used to treat cancer. And where I have the arrows here are some of the targets that have been uh, used or are being used right now to uh, treat uveal melanoma. And, and here is that uh, focal adhesion kinase that I mentioned previously, uh, that is uh, one of the trials that's been done and we're doing at the Sylvester as well. Now, an inflamed tumor microenvironment is associated with response to immunotherapy. We're not, we all know that. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is what an inflamed uh, tumor microenvironment looks. It has abundant tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, infiltration by CD8 T cells, uh, expression of interferon gamma, and expression of PDL1 and other checkpoints. Now, this uh, data shows uh, where the arrow is. You can see that a T flame uh, phenotype for the tumor microenvironment here. Is, is, is not really present in the majority of uveal melanoma primary tumors compared to, on the right, patients that have cutaneous melanoma. And this has been felt to explain why these patients do not respond well to uh, immunotherapy. Uh, and here we have some data to show that. On, uh, on the top, we see some data using ipilimumab, an immunotherapy that targets CTLA-4. And you can see the one-year survivals and the median overall survivals there are not particularly different from what I showed you before in that meta-analysis. And in the second table below that, uh, there's data on responses for PD-1 uh, inhibition. Um, but as you go and combine PD-1 with CTLA-4 inhibitions, ipilimumab and ivalumab, the numbers now are uh, a, a little bit higher in terms of response rate and maybe outcomes, but we're still talking about numbers in the 9 to 12% range. Uh, here is uh, a, uh, an interesting uh, new uh, drug. It's one of the most hopeful leads in the development of effective therapy for metastatic melanoma. This is called a T-cell redirector. Dr. Mentioned, Dr. Harbour mentioned that before. The top part of the molecule has high affinity for GP100 molecules on HLA-82, and the lower part of the molecule, uh, molecule is an anti-CD3 antibody that binds uh, uh, CD3 expressing T cell, so bringing the tumor close to the T cell. Um, and, 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 and as previously mentioned, GP100 is widely expressed both in cutaneous as well as uveal melanoma. Uh, here is some data with this drug. This is non-randomized data. 
uh, in which uh, median overall survivals and response rates are compared to three meta-analysis, you can see that there appears to be some uh, uh, difference. Uh, the median overall survivals in those two non-randomized trials were over 16 months, and there was and the overall rate, overall survival rate at one year, appeared to be significantly better. And better yet, there has been a recent press release, although we have not really seen the full data, in a trial in which this drug was randomized to investigator choice uh, in metastatic uveal melanoma. And what it did show is that the primary endpoint of the trial that was overall survival uh, appeared to have been reached in the first uh, interim analysis that was conducted. Uh, so the hazard ratio was 0 0.51 favoring Abentifus, uh, which is uh, the name of this drug. Uh, and the one year survival rate uh, was 73% for this drug compared to 58%. So uh, if this is uh, indeed uh, a panel in, in, in the subsequent analysis, eventually this drug is going to be submitted to the FDA and maybe the first drug that actually shows significant uh, uh, effect on survival in these patients. Uh, another uh, uh, technique that has been res res resurrected is the use of adoptive transfer uh, therapy in this case of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is based on the study of only 20 patients, but it did show a number of responses, 35%, uh, uh, including this one patient here uh, on the right that has the complete response. I had a patient that was refractory to um, refractory to uh, 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 checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and and finally. Uh, uh, you know, se single cell sequencing data from Dr. Harbour's lab, which he previously mentioned, demonstrated a very novel finding that indeed the T cells that are infiltrating these uveal melanoma cells express low levels of CTLA-4 and PD-1, which is expected and explains why treatments targeting PD-1 and CTLA-4 may not be affected. But more importantly, it was shown for the first time that these cells express high levels of another inhibitory exhaustion marker called LAG3. And based on that, uh, as was mentioned before, we initiated a clinical trial uh, of four patients with previously untreated uh, uveal melanoma, previously untreated with immunotherapy. These patients can be previously treated with other forms of therapy. Uh, and we combine here nivolumab, which is a PD-1 blocking antibody with relatlimab, which is a leg three blocking antibody. These patients will be treated uh, with these two drugs given every four weeks for as long as they respond or until disease progresses or until they have toxicity. Uh, we have already uh, started treating patients. We have three patients that have been treated. We have uh, you know, several others that might be treating soon. Uh, uh, if we do see a positive signal here, our uh, intent is to uh, go with expansion core cohorts, maybe adding additional um, uh, immune um, uh, modulators to this. And at some point, uh, uh, we may get into a larger multicenter uh, trial and move on to the adjuvant setting. Speaking of which, uh, so we have a great prognostic tool to identify patients that will likely develop metastatic disease. The next obvious step is to try to prevent these recurrences. So the problem is that we've been trying to do that without having any effective therapies in the advanced setting. Uh, so, so the result of that is somewhat predictable that uh, you know, these would not be successful. Uh, so here are some of these adjuvant studies, uh, or most of these adjuvant studies in uveal melanoma, and they have spanned from chemotherapy to targeted therapy to immunotherapy and to liver-directed therapy. And I don't expect you to read this, and I'm just going to tell you you don't have to because all of these studies are negative studies. Um, Dr. Harbour mentioned that uh, quizinostat, which is, a, is an HDAC4 uh, inhibitor, um, uh, histone deacetylase inhibitor, uh, has shown inhibition of growth of this BAP1 mutant uh, uveal melanoma xenografts 
and and uh, again, I show you the same picture he did before, showing that it seems to be actually specific for BAP1 mutated uh, tumors. And and based on on this data, uh, we have in fact uh, uh, proposed a trial of adjuvant presenostat in patients with high risk uveal melanoma. Uh, so what we're targeting here is to decrease the rate of recurrence of distant metastasis at 32 months of these patients from 50%, break it down to 25%. Uh, and these patients will be a very selected uh, population, very enriched for high risk, will be patients with high risk class two uveal melanoma as determined by gene expression uh, profile. And I may have exhausted my time, so I, I think, uh, 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 I'll just go to my last slide and say the uveal melanoma is a potentially fatal disease uh, to 50% of patients. It has been understudied, underfunded, and recent insights uh, in the molecular and immunobiology of uveal melanoma have brought some more hope. Uh, there's a generation of clinical trials with new targets, new collaborative groups, new funding mechanisms, and I feel that there might indeed be light at the end of the tunnel. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lutsky. And um, I, I remind all of our participants from all over the world who are here that we're going to take another 15 minutes so that we don't have a hard stop at seven o'clock, which we've bypassed. But let's go to our final poll question and uh, see how we do here. Now, the following statements I'm about to read are about advanced uveal melanoma, which one is incorrect? Incorrect. A, the most common site of metastatic disease is the liver. B, PRAME positivity adds additional recurrence risk only to class two patients. C, there's no standard systemic treatment for metastatic disease. D, early data on tebentifus suggest benefit. And E, the T cells in the tumor microenvironment express multiple exhaustion markers. Which one is incorrect? Let's see how our participants answer this before we go into the Q&A session and we have a few questions to ask. So I'll ask um, our experts to be quick um, in your responses so we can get a few in. So what do you think here, Dr. Lutsky? How'd, how'd they do? I think they did great, everybody. Um, um, that This is the correct answer indeed. Um, metastatic disease to the liver tends to be the first site uh, uh, in these patients uh, and is the most common site indeed. Frame positivity adds additional recurrence risk to both class one and class two patients. Uh, there's certainly no standard systemic therapy for metastatic disease in uveal melanoma. Uh, the early data on tebentifus, as I showed you, uh, suggests that, ben that suggested there might be benefit. And, uh, uh, and as shown by Dr. Harbour's work, the T cells in the tumor microenvironment express multiple exhaustion markers, including lag three, which we are taking advantage of in terms of uh, a new clinical trial. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lutskin. And I know that you mentioned clinical trials and participating at UMH. So um, there is a question about that. So we'll get to that in a second so that you can clarify and, and tell your colleagues out there what's available. But this question I'm gonna tee up for Dr. Harbour. Is there any treatment in melanoma T2 which changes the prognosis in these patients? Dr. Harbour. Yeah, so, um, you know, by T2, uh, you know, we're, we're referring to the AJCC TNM classification, which, uh, as Dr. Lutsky um, mentioned, is not um, very accurate. It, it's, it's good at putting patients sort of into low, medium, and high risk groups, but it's not accurate enough to uh, really say if you're in the highest risk group, such as a class two a tumor. But um, uh, I, I think more generally, the, the, the question is, uh, is there any evidence that if we know somebody's at elevated risk um, of metastasis, is there any evidence that anything we can do improves their survival? And Dr. Lovsky uh, mentioned several points of evidence. Now, we don't have solid prospective randomized clinical trial evidence yet, but we have several hints of that. Number one, if we do uh, do surveillance on high-risk patients, and we identify their metastatic disease earlier, um, it does extend their survival. Now, some of that is um, 
is uh, because of uh, a lead time bias, but not all of it for sure. Um, and um, uh, the other evidence uh, comes from uh, from um, uh, the uh, there. There is an adjuvant trial that has been done with sutent uh, or sunitinib, uh, which also is not prospective and randomized, but it also showed some evidence of potential uh, benefit. So um, I think that uh, that um, the 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 um, the, the clear evidence that we need is going to require um, uh, rigorous clinical trials, which we're now putting in place uh, increasingly here and elsewhere. And that will be the way that we can move forward um, uh, uh, with more solid evidence. Thank you, Dr. Harbour. Um, I'm going to present this one to Dr. Correa. And that is, how long should you wait after radiation to perform vitreo retinal surgery safely, Dr. Correa? Thank you, that is a great question because that is a question we've been asking ourselves too. Um, so the Germans have shown us that um, they have done vitreo retinal surgery successfully as early as one week after radiation. Um, here at Bascom Palmer, we're waiting at least two weeks to be safer and to ensure that we know the tumor is definitely treated. However, there isn't really a lot of evidence into the early response of the tumor to radiation. And that's something that we're looking into right now to try to clarify what would be really scientifically based a uh, uh, a very secure or safe time to intervene in those cases, especially when we are dealing with large tumors. Okay, and I think that this is an important question that just came over and I'm not sure who should take this, but- um, May I respond to that before you move on? Of um, course, Dr. Harper. I just ahead. wanted to add to Dr. Cohea's uh, comment. You know, one of the exciting things about having Dr. Cohea join me here is that she does these type of surgeries that really only a small handful uh, of people in the world uh, do the type of surgery that she showed you in her videos. And it gives us a unique opportunity to actually answer that question scientifically. Um, we've done a number of these endoresections now and we take these samples to the laboratory and uh, as soon as a week after plaque radiotherapy, there are no viable cells that we can find in the laboratory viable meaning able to proliferate uh, and grow and, and uh, invade and, and, uh, and to have motility. They're morphologically intact, but they're not viable. So um, we're, we're getting more scientific answers to that question. When I was in training, they said you had to wait at least a year. There's really no evidence at all for that. That was just an opinion. But now we're able with this type of surgery that Dr. Kohe is doing, we can answer these questions scientifically. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and this is the question that uh, I wanted to ask, and that is, any economically available systemic treatment for metastatic uveal melanoma in poor income countries? I guess I should take that very difficult question. Uh, I, I think because a lot of these new treatments, immunotherapy, for example, these drugs are, are indeed very expensive. Um, so I think the first thing we need to think is to do no harm, which is we don't want to use ineffective therapy. We don't want to use cheap, but uh, complicated, um, uh, very uh, uh, toxic chemotherapy, for example, in these patients. I mean, the data really does not show a benefit for chemotherapy. I, what I would focus on and try to identify metastatic disease early uh, you know, an ultrasound is not expensive. You can use ultrasound, or you can use a plain chest x-ray. Um, uh, and once you identify disease early, maybe you can use liver-directed therapies that can uh, and indeed seem to prolong life. Uh, so I, I think that would be a good strategy uh, to do it in an economically feasible way without having to resort to very expensive uh, uh, drugs that to be fair, at, at this moment, uh, you know, do not uh, really fit the category of standard of care. Yeah. And Dr. Lutsky, while we have you, um, you talked about clinical trials, you spoke about uh, liver-directed uh, therapies for patients. So 
um, to, to talk to your colleagues tonight, how can patients, any of their patients participate in a clinical trial at University of Miami uh, Health, Sylvester, et cetera? Yeah, I, I, I think the first step would be, uh, you know, we can, we can do, uh, especially now in this era of, of virtual uh, uh, consultations, you know, we can, uh, you know, maybe they can send me an email and can see if it is appropriate for these patients to, uh, to have a virtual consult. Uh, ideally, the physician should contact me and we can have a conversation uh, and see if indeed it makes sense for these patients to, to, to come and participate. We have a number of trials that uh, they might be eligible for. And, and if we don't see you know, from an, an initial conversation that, 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 that those patients are eligible, it might not be worth they, you know, coming all the way up to, to Miami. Okay, and I think uh, we're, we're gonna leave you, uh, Dr. Harbour, with this final question that uh, one of your colleagues um, was impressed by, and, and that is the role of COVID-19 uh, risk-related genes on the chromosomes as a risk factor. Um, how, does, how do you think that that works? He'd like to find out. Well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, we don't have a, a definite answer, of course, but it, it's tantalizing to uh, think about how that might work. And uh, what, we, what we know is that different ancestries carry different risks of various diseases. Uh, and, um, uh, and we know that if we go back far enough in our ancestors, there are uh, human, humans uh, that we call Neanderthals that came from certain areas. And one of the reasons for their demise was their immune, uh, their, they had a lot of immune problems. Um, and it turns out that a lot of immune related diseases now seem to be in people who have enriched areas of their genome that were inherited from these uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA segments. And what they just uh, published, I believe it was in Nature uh, a month or so ago, uh, was that patients that had severe COVID-19 outcomes were enriched for this chromosomal segment on uh, chromosome uh, three. Now, the, the region that we found in uva melanomas is not exactly the same, it's extremely close by, but there do happen to be a sort of cassette or region of immune-related genes in this area that uh, tend to have enriched uh, inheritance from this so-called Neanderthal uh, DNA. So the way I think it would work potentially would be that um, the, the immune cells uh, 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 have difficulty if they inherit certain um, versions of these genes in fighting off uh, uh, um, uh, tumor cells and potentially infections. So it's something that we're actively investigating now. Fascinating, and the more and more we learn about COVID-19 every day. Um, we cannot thank you enough, and your colleagues certainly hung in there for more than an hour. Uh, Dr. William Harbour, Dr. Zelia Correa, Dr. Jose Lutsky, thank you so much for your brilliant insight and sharing this with us, because our program has come to an end. But we want to assure you that the uh, University of Miami Health System, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer, Cent Cancer Center, are here for you and ready uh, for your patients. Um, should you want to go to bascompalmer.org to learn more about the topics covered, uhealthinternational.com to refer patients for virtual or in-person appointments. And please complete the survey at the end of this so that we can uh, lead to other topics in the future. Thank you all so very much to all of our brilliant presenters tonight. Good night, everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, good night.